One of the world's largest and most influential human rights organizations is facing an unusual amount of public criticism. Two Nobel Peace Prize laureates, Adolfo Perez Esquivel and Myred Maguire, and a group of over a hundred scholars have written an open letter to Human Rights Watch, criticizing what they describe as the group's close ties to the U.S. government. The letter claims there is a revolving door between the U.S. government and Human Rights Watch, and that it has impacted the organization's work in certain countries, including Venezuela. It cites the example of Tom Malinowski. In the 1990s, he served as a special assistant to President Bill Clinton and as a speechwriter to Secretary of State Madeleine Albright. Then he became HRW's Washington Advocacy Director. Then last year, he left the organization after being nominated as Assistant Secretary of State for Democracy, Human Rights and Labor under John Kerry. The letter also notes a former CIA analyst named Miguel Diaz, who sat on a Human Rights Watch advisory committee from 2003 to 2011. Diaz is now at the State Department. The letter urges Human Rights Watch to bar those who have crafted or executed U.S. foreign policy from serving as staff, advisors or board members. Human Rights Watch Executive Director Kenneth Roth has defended his organization's independence. In a recent letter to the Nobel laureates, Roth wrote, quote, We're careful to ensure that prior affiliations do not affect the impartiality of Human Rights Watch's work. Roth went on to highlight the group's history of criticizing the U.S. human rights record. Roth wrote, quote, We routinely expose, document, and denounce human rights violations by the U.S. government, including torture, indefinite detention, illegal renditions, unchecked mass surveillance, abusive use of drones, harsh sentencing, and racial disparity in criminal justice, and an unfair and ineffective immigration system. Well, today we host a debate. Reed Brody is counsel and spokesperson for Human Rights Watch. He worked as lead counsel for the victims in the case of the exiled former dictator Chad um, Hissane Habre and in the case of Augusta Pinochet and Jean-Claude Baby Doc Duvalier in Haiti. Keen Bott is the lead organizer of the Open Letter to Human Rights Watch. Earlier this year, he wrote an article headlined The Hypocrisy of Human Rights Watch. He's a Washington, D.C.-based writer and activist. Well, Keen Bott, you're the one who wrote the letter that was signed by the Nobel laureates and about 100 scholars. Explain your concerns with Human Rights Watch. The concern is uh, that the revolving door process that we delineated in the letter uh, leads to a perverse incentive structure. That is to say, if you are a Human Rights Watch staff member and you are to criticize harshly and in principle terms actions by the U.S. government, one shouldn't have in the back of his or her mind the possibility of actually working for that government. And we think that that possibility of looking at the U.S. government, which, you know, the Human Rights Watch should be antagonistic towards, uh, along with any other government, one should not see that as a possibility for future career advancement. And that generates perverse incentives. Uh, the revolving door process is something that's uh, quite clearly understood in other industries, like the financial sector, in which you have uh, a revolving door there. So we are simply saying that in the case of Human Rights Watch, which uh, uh, stands by its independence, that it should demonstrate that independence further by implementing an actual policy to have either a cooling off period uh, before and after uh, HRW uh, associates go into the U.S. government, or that they simply bar the, the, those who have created or execute U.S. foreign policy, given that the U.S. foreign policy establishment in the U.S. government is a, a routine human rights violator. Reed Brody. Well, first of all, I want to thank you for giving us the opportunity to come on to discuss uh, these charges. Um, unfortunately, every time Human Rights Watch publishes a report on Venezuela, um, this is what happens. Uh, the government and the people who support the government um, then uh, denounce Human Rights Watch. Uh, this is not the first sign-on letter of this kind. This one is particularly pernicious because of the charges it raises, um, this idea that somehow Human Rights Watch is in lockstep uh, with, the, with the U.S. government because of some revolving door policy. I think um, anyone who's familiar with our work, anyone who takes the time to look at our website, um, would see, first of all, um, that we routinely criticize the U.S. government. We routinely criticize, in fact, earlier this week, Amy, you had on your show a Human Rights Watch researcher, together with a recently freed Bahraini activist, criticizing the U.S. government um, for its support of the uh, government in Bahrain. Um, there, we have 399 people on staff from 67 countries. Um, we have people, uh, there's probably a handful of people 
uh, who have worked for the U.S. government. Um, there are also people who've worked for the governments of Brazil, Canada, France, Germany, Mexico, the Netherlands, Norway, Peru, Spain, South Africa, Sweden, and the United Kingdom. Now, I could go through the list of the directors, uh, the regional directors, our, our Africa director, a former uh, Ethiopian political prisoner under U.S. ally Melissa Sanawi, the person in charge of all our uh, program, Ian Levine, who you know, um, uh, a, a British trained nurse, 10 years in, uh, in, in Africa, then UNICEF, then Amnesty International. Ken Roth, the director of Human Rights Watch, 27 consecutive years at Human Rights Watch. There's a handful of people. Uh, this revolving door policy, if we implemented it, would have changed one person at Human Rights Watch. To the extent that there is a revolving door policy at Human Rights Watch, it's with the United Nations. Um, there are many people, myself included, um, who have worked at the United Nations, the U.N. High Commissioner for Refugees, the U.N. High Commissioner for Human Rights. Um, so this is there, there really is no basis to this kind of allegation. So, Keen Pat, can you respond specifically uh, to what Reid Brody said about the number of former government officials from a number of other countries who are employed at Human yeah. Rights Watch? Why the specific focus on U.S. government officials? Well, one, uh, what we're talking about is both working for the U.S. government before and after Human Rights Watch. In all of the countries that you listed, I'm not aware of people who have worked in that government, then in Human Rights Watch, and then back into government. And that's the revolving door phenomenon. So if if you have uh, credible evidence of those people, we would probably oppose that as well. But the second point about uh, focusing on the United States is that as opposed to Peru or Mexico or Brazil, uh, the United States is the world's largest military hegemon. And as the world's sole superpower, which has committed, you know, various human rights violations on, a, on an order of magnitude far beyond the scope of anything that uh, could be accused upon uh, uh, Mexico or, or another country, uh, this is really the, the core issue. And I just want to ask you, if it's only two people, uh, Miguel Diaz from the CIA, uh, who's now an interlocutor Miguel Diaz never worked at Human Rights Watch. We have over 200 people on advisory committees. So then, if, uh, the, which, if the advisory committee is simply an honorary title, what kind of message is that sending to the world that somebody who's worked at the CIA, perhaps the, the world's greatest institutional human rights violator in the past half century, uh, is, is there as a, a way for, um, uh, as, as a kind of a form of credentials? Uh, you know, what does, that, what does that symbolize to the rest of the world when you talk about your independence? And then and secondly, when he goes into the State Department and his job title is explicitly serving as an interlocutor before the intelligence, between the intelligence community and non-government experts, namely Human Rights Watch and other organizations, uh, what does that signal to the international community? So let's not even dispute uh, the, the question of whether HRW's advocacy is aligned with U.S. foreign policy. The very appearance, the very fact that we're having this debate is indicative of the need of having no, some very, kind of a policy this debate is that the Venezuelan government and people who support the Venezuelan government cannot tolerate criticism of Venezuela. I think this is a complete That's why we're having this debate. To, to, to now, simply let me, answer, me. let me answer the questions, though, about Miguel Diaz. We have 200 people on our advisory committees. We have advisory committees for each branch of Human Rights Watch. It's a big tent. We've got people on the right. We've got people on the left. Costa Gavras is on our advisory committee. Bernadine Dorn is on our advisory committee. Tahir Benjaloun, Mike Farrell. This is this is not a question of left or right. This is a question of people who are associated with leading human rights at, at, violators at, at, at the working there. What can he bring to the table? What can he advise the, upon the time, on human rights when he's worked at, at the, the CIA? That, at and the he's time using that Miguel Diaz was on the advisory committee, he was the Latin American director of CSIS, a, think, a, a, a public policy think tank in Washington. Those are the kinds of positions that you bring to an advisory committee. You bring people from the field, you bring people from think tanks, you bring former public policy people, you bring government officials, well, the, form, former government officials. We have a rule that you cannot obviously be a government official at the same time that you're on the board, on the advisory committee, or on the staff of Human Rights Watch. 
Kim, can I just ask you to outline specifically, you were in particular critical of the way in which Human Rights Watch has covered uh, uh, Venezuela. So could you outline what some of your uh, criticisms were? Yeah. First, I would dispute the uh, contention that this is simply uh, an effort by Venezuela supporters to try to tarnish HRW's good name. Again, uh, Reed Brody is not addressing the core issue here about a revolving door that's taking place. Does he dispute the fact no revolving th there door. is no revolving door if Tom Malinowski works at this one person. Uh, okay. Can you explain the significance of who Tom Malinowski is? Well, Tom Malinowski is an interesting case. He worked at the White House National Security Council uh, for Bill Clinton as its senior director when Bill Clinton initiated the Yugoslavia bombings, uh, which Human Rights Watch itself classified as uh, committing violations of international humanitarian law. Secondly, he was a speechwriter for Madeleine Albright when she made the infamous comments that uh, the price is worth it in terms of imposing U.S. sanctions that may have killed uh, half a million Iraqi children. Uh, Malinowski then worked at Human Rights Watch as its lead lobbyist, and then immediately after became the Assistant Secretary of State. Uh, you know, and so the kinds of comments that he made, uh, for example, in reference to Libya uh, after the uh, NATO intervention, um, are completely unalloyed in in their in their uh, in their support. And so when Tom Malinowski is strongly supportive of NATO interventions uh, and then goes on to work at the Obama uh, administration, which is a human rights violator. For example, you know, the, the, the secret kill list in which Obama has the right to murder anyone in the planet uh, based on, you know, secret order without any judicial oversight. These are the kinds of uh, problems that exist and whether or not, uh, uh, whether or not the, the, the advocacy is, is tarnished, the appearance of this revolving door should be addressed. Reed Bird. You know, Human Rights Watch has called for criminal investigation to be opened against the former president of the United States, George Bush, against Donald Rumsfeld, against Dick Cheney, against um, George Tenet. Uh, Ken Roth was on your show talking about that. So um, then just last month, two months ago, while Tom Melanowski was going into the U.S. government, Ken Roth wrote an op-ed called Obama the Disappointment. I mean, to, su to suggest that somehow that, that there's this great conspiracy that, that um, you know, we're, all, we're in lockstep with the U.S. government because Tom, because, because, you know, now and then, in this case, one person uh, went from Human Rights Watch to the U.S. government. It just really, it, you know, people on your show um, should look at our website, read our reports, read Ken Roth's articles, read our, 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 our reporting on Venezuela and on, and on, on other U.S. allies, on countries like Mexico, Uzbekistan, uh, Israel, Egypt. Yeah, uh, well... Well, you've pointed out, Keen, that uh, you want a Human Rights Watch to be as critical of the Obama administration as it has been of the Bush administration, and Human Rights Watch has failed to do that. Could That's you elaborate? That's correct. I mean, if criminal investigations should be launched against the Bush administration, then clearly the continuation of CIA renditions, the use of torture in Bagram and in Somalia, which Jeremy Scahill uh, quite clearly demonstrated on this broadcast, uh, the fact that uh, Amrit Singh from the Open Society Justice Initiative was also on this program discussing the continuous use of uh, renditions. Again, uh, a, a level of human rights a violation that's perhaps, you know, unparalleled, a secret kill list uh, to kill anyone on the planet. Uh, all of these instances demand criminal investigations, and the fact that, uh, that, that they haven't been pushed by Human Rights Watch uh, for Clinton, where Tom Malinowski once worked, and, and Obama, where he now works, is indicative of this issue. And secondly, I think that the core issue here is that when uh, HRW makes criticisms toward NATO, what signal does that send the international community when NATO's former secretary general, Javier Solana, is on the board of directors at HRW? This is somebody who HRW itself uh, uh, criticized for presiding over violations of international humanitarian law. So why don't we make a simple policy? Isn't Those that, who, who bear isn't direct that... responsibility for human rights violations should not be on the board of directors of an independent human rights organization. I, I would agree with 
with that. So let's, 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 let's agree on that. We should have a, an immediate removal of uh, Javier Solana from the board of directors, given that his power uh, includes being able to uh, remove staff at HRW. That's what board of directors at, at, at nonprofits do. So this person, Human when, rights when he's watch. on that board, I mean, the, pr the proof that the what you're saying is not correct, it, it, you've given it. Human Rights Watch has reported. Um, I mean, as soon as as soon as NATO or the United States or Israel or anyone else uh, is involved in military action, um, we are on the ground as soon as possible to document possible violations of war. And, and we've done that in the case watch, of NATO and, has and Human Rights Watch advocated criminal investigations or taking Javier Solana to the International Criminal Court for his presiding over violations of international we, humanitarian we, law? We have not suggested that Javier Solana was personally involved in the violations of international humanitarian law. There's a difference um, between violations of the laws of war, which we, Human Rights Watch, has documented, um, and the personal criminal liability of different people in different in, 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 the, in organizations. Right. So the question Please. of uh, th that's, that's the core issue, because when HRW documents uh, atrocities committed by NATO, but then does not carry them to their we logical conclusion them as but, okay. uh, 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 human rights violations, let's say, uh, but that does not carry them to their logical conclusion, that leads uh, the international community to to question the independence. Look, I don't the United think the States, international and community it's, is the United States is considered the by the watch. world in a recent poll to be the greatest threat to world peace today by three times the margin of the second runner-up. So what does it say to the world when HRW has somebody who's presided over a military organization? What does he bring to the table? What can he actually provide in terms of his insights and knowledge of human rights when he's somebody who presided over the, the, the bombing of civilian targets, the use of cluster munition, munitions, and, and so on? Javier Solano was the, was the foreign minister of Spain. Um, He's the I Secretary General of NATO. He was. He was the Secretary General of NATO. Um, he brings to the table his foreign policy experience. Um, we have not. We have been very critical of NATO in in Libya, um, but we have not alleged that he or that NATO um, was involved in in war crimes or that he was personally involved in war crimes. And, Reid Brody, could you respond also to what Keane brought up about uh, Human Rights Watch not being as critical of Obama administration officials for continuing uh, uh, Bush uh, well, I mean, uh, policies? I just, two, two, two months ago, Ken Roth, Politico, Obama, the disappointment. Obama has di I just read the first one. Obama has disappointed many by failing to make human rights a priority. True, he has stood up for people's rights where there are few strategic interests at play in places such as Venezuela and Zimbabwe, uh, but his readiness to compromise in places like Afghanistan, Egypt, Mexico, Uzbekistan, Yemen, leave the impression that he's not committed to the human rights ideal. We have documented in Yemen, for instance, um, the human cost of, of, of drones. Um, we have taken Obama, the Obama administration, to task for its failure to live up to the promises he made a year ago um, regarding transparency in the use of drones. So just because we're not calling for Obama to be prosecuted, that's not the test. When, when someone is involved, as we believe, um, directly, I mean, George Bush uh, admitted uh, that he authorized waterboarding. Um, Human Rights Watch documents we were in Libya. Um, our people went into Gaddafi's former Secret Service headquarters and discovered the files um, that showed that the U.S. was sending uh, uh, prisoners um, to Libya um, to be interrogated, where they were tortured. We have called for criminal prosecutions on those bases. Um, we have. But, but criminal prosecution is not the only touchstone um, for criticism of a government. We haven't called for the prosecution of, of, of Chavez and, and, and of Maduro. Yeah, we, that's because Chavez and Maduro have nowhere near the human rights record of the, the Obama administration. Uh, and, and, and secondly, the, the, that's the core question, is whether or not HRW chooses to operationalize its uh, uh, relatively tepid uh, criticisms of Obama, given the severity of those human rights violations. Let's take the case of drone strikes in, in, in Yemen, for example. What Human Rights Watch is advocating is not for
for the immediate cessation of drone strikes, which have killed hundreds of civilians around the world. What they're asking for is greater transparency on the legal rationale for a continuation of those drone strikes. So the idea that the United States can treat the entire planet as a legitimate battlefield is simply unquestioned. No, and secondly, would, would, would HRW ask for the legal rationale from the Cuban government for why it carried out a drone assassination against Luis Posada Carriles? No, of course it would immediately denounce a violation of that sovereignty, the, 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 the issue of that, and they, and they wouldn't be asking the Justice Ministry of Cuba to, to, to justify its, its uh, use of, of, of missile strikes on Florida. I don't believe we've ever talked about that case. Well, one of the criticisms of Human Rights Watch in the open letter focused on its position on Syria. Human Rights Watch Executive Director Kenneth Roth posted a series of tweets last summer as the Obama administration was contemplating military action following the use of chemical weapons in August. In one, Roth tweeted, quote, if Obama decides to strike Syria, will he settle for symbolism or do something that will help protect civilians? Roth subsequently appeared on Russia Today and explained his organization's position. We are explicitly not taking a position for or against particular airstrikes. Our main focus, as you can find in the statements that we've issued, is that our concern is with protecting civilian lives. Um, and obviously, you know, the, the issue on the table at the moment are the approximately 1,400 civilians who died as a result of the chemical weapons attacks in the Damascus suburbs. But obviously, we're concerned about the you know, tens of thousands, if not 100,000 civilians who have died during the conflict, mostly at the hands of conventional weapons. And our, our concern is that while there is heightened attention uh, to this problem of Syria now, we hope that the answer is going to address the plight of civilians across the board. That was Kenneth Roth, executive director of Human Rights Watch, speaking last year on Russia Today. Uh, Keenpat, can you explain why it is that you were critical of uh, the position that Human Rights Watch took on Syria? Well, I'm not critical on the question of neutrality when it comes to intervention, uh, um, but really what his tweets show, and that's not the only tweet, there's, there's numerous tweets, which allow for plausible deniability, but in their effect and in their preponderance show a, a, a real egging on of the Obama administration at the height of calls for a U.S. bombing on Syria. And we think that this is simply unbecoming of, a, of the, the head of a human rights organization to be asking for more, more than symbolic bombing, but a really uh, serious kind of a bombing that actually can, can uh, uh, protect civilians. I think that this is completely irresponsible, and yes, there might be ways to, to, to weasel out of that, the implications of that tweet and other tweets. And people can go to my Twitter to see the, the, the full list of Ken Roth's uh, tweets uh, encouraging uh, uh, a, ser a serious strike. But, but I, I think that this is something that, that really shows the, the need for a, a separation, a firewall between uh, HRW and NATO and the U.S. government. Reed Brody of Human Sorry, Rights Watch. There the, needs to be a firewall between Ken Roth and the, human ra and, and, and the U.S. government. Ken Roth there needs to has be never. Ken Roth has spent the last 27 years at Human Rights Watch. Um, I really don't imagine that Ken Roth will ever be working for the United States government. But let me address the issue of of of, of intervention. Human Rights Watch, and and you can see on our website, you can hear it from Ken. Human Rights Watch does not call, has not called for an armed intervention or any intervention. Well, we've called for humanitarian intervention. We've called for the assistance um, to 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 displaced people. Um, the, le you know, the, the countries of the world in 2005, all the countries at the General Assembly um, the, uh, uh, agreed that there were certain circumstances um, that invoked what they called the right to protect, when um, it may be necessary uh, for the international community even to use force. Um, uh, and th that's the lesson of, of, of Srebrenica. It's the lesson of Rwanda. Now, Human Rights Watch has not called, in fact, since Rwanda, the last time that Human Rights Watch called for an inter a military intervention um, was, in, was, was over 20 years ago um, in Rwanda. Um, so, and to suggest, um, and to suggest otherwise um, is, 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 you know, the, the, the the policy of Human Rights Watch and what Ken was, 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 was saying was the touchstone is, are you going to protect civilians? 
So, um, and how are you? What what is the plan to protect civilians? And we did not criticize. Um, uh, in, in the letter, you make an equivalence. You say, well, we criticized Syria's bombing of civilians, but we didn't criticize the U.S. for threatening um, a military intervention. Yeah. But, but Human Rights Watch. Okay, go ahead. So that's, that's, that's another issue, uh, which is that the parameters for HRW are narrow, such that, it, you know, it, violations of international law, such as the threat or use of force, are outside of uh, HRW's purview. What that means is that the lone military superpower in the world, which has violated international law on many occasions, uh, for example, in the case of Iraq, which led to the deaths of perhaps one million Iraqis, uh, perhaps the greatest hum you know, human rights catastrophe of the 21st century. Uh, because HRW's purview does not allow it to oppose uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, violations of international law, such as the threat or use of force, um, you know, we think that that's a defect. But what I'm saying is a narrower uh, point, which is that if HRW has a stated policy of neutrality, then Tom Malinowski should not be endorsing and praising uh, Libya, the, the, the Libya strikes by NATO in Human pieces Rights of foreign Watch, policy. Human Rights Watch and it is should the not organization be, uh, which documented the effects on again, civilians of the NATO again, strikes. Again, documentation is different from advocacy and operationalizing that research. And when Tom Malinowski completely omits the findings of HRW itself on the cases of 72 civilians killed in eight uh, missile strikes by NATO and Libya We're the ones in his who extensive that. pieces. I Where understand does that information that. Exactly come from? It point. comes from Human Rights Watch. That's exactly my point. When Tom Malinowski, as the Washington advocacy director, simply omits that finding from his piece on NATO's role in Libya, what that does is it raises reasonable suspicions that this person is thinking about possibilities of working within the Obama administration. And sure enough, by having a completely unconditional support and saying that what Libya shows is that Obama should be further engaged in the Arab Spring, uh, what that does is it creates reasonable suspicions, and that's why it's crucial for HRW to impose some kind of a cooling off period. Uh, there's 15,500 people who have signed our petition at rootsaction.org demanding for a, just a basic cooling off period. Whether We can go out, back and forth all day discussing HRW's policy priorities, but if it doesn't affect HRW's advocacy, then there should be no problem implementing such a proposal. It's a very common sense proposal that's understood uh, in any other industry, the human rights industry should be no different. You know, again, I mean, look at who is at Human Rights Watch. I'm sorry. If you go position by position at Human Rights Watch, um, you find people, you know, our, our America's director, a Chilean human rights activist, never worked in the government. Our, our UN director, so a Le Monde so Le Mans would a cooling off period threaten this? As you point out, it would affect very few people. You know, I think that this is a gimmick. It's a gimmick to tie together criticism of Venezuela, take something here, take something there, and make it. It's a solution to a problem that does not exist. Okay, I've we have four. On Venezuela. We, we ha I know you. I, and, and, I know that frankly, you haven't talked. You, you, you know, haven't the people talked that we're talking Venezuela about, Marie here. McGuire, Adolfo Perez Esquivel, these people are not Venezuela experts. They're not defending the Venezuelan government in any sense. What we're you know, talking about is the need for HRW where this to preserve comes, its where credibility as an independent organization. I'm, I'm very glad that you're concerned about Human Rights Watch's credibility. I think that our reports speak for themselves. The track record, the biographies of the people um, at Human Rights Watch speak for themselves. Let me ask you something, Kim. But why do you care about Human Rights Watch in the um, in the work that you do? Why is it so important to you? Uh, Human Rights Watch, you know, with its endowment, a hundred million dollar endowment from George Soros, uh, is the leading uh, human rights organization uh, uh, in, in the world. And it sets an agenda for other organizations. It also has, you know, an outsized influence in Congress. And it has a very powerful uh, network uh, within the media to get its message out. And we think that uh, if it were more independent, uh, that it would be leveraging those very important assets towards, you know, doing more effective human rights advocacy. So in the case of Aristide in 2004, uh, Human Rights Watch barely lifted a finger in the face of massive atrocities, perhaps the worst human rights situation in the hemisphere at that time, in the Western Hemisphere. You know, HRW could have simply, you know, uh, positioned op-eds in the Washington Post or the New York Times or elsewhere, demanding the immediate restitution of the constitutional government of Aristide and denouncing the atrocity that took place. Why didn't that happen? You know, the Bush administration 
administration literally kidnapped Aristide, as viewers of Democracy Now! know uh, from that reporting, and flew him to the Central African Republic. You know, in that context, under a coup government in which thousands of people were being slaughtered in Port-au-Prince alone, you know, HRW should have taken a stronger approach. And we don't think that it's coincidental that, you know, the U.S. role in that coup and the subsequent, you know, atrocities that took place had a, had a role in HRW's relative silence. First of all, you know my history in Haiti. Um, uh, you mentioned at the top of the show, um, I'm involved in the prosecution of a string of U.S.-backed dictators, one of them being Jean-Claude Duvalier. Um, we've called for—I've been trying to get—I went to Panama to try to get the coup leader, Raul Cedras, um, back to Haiti. Um, uh, Rios Mont, Hissen Habre, uh, Pinochet. I mean, these are U.S.-backed dictators that we're involved in prosecuting. Um, in the case of Haiti, um, we are on the ground in Haiti, uh, working for the prosecution of the former dictator. Where were you um, in 2004, uh, after the coup? Why did HRW send a letter to Colin Powell, not urging for the immediate restitution, the immediate reinstatement of Aristide, but simply asking Colin Powell, the Bush administration, which kidnapped Aristide, to put pressure on the coup government that it installed to prosecute both paramilitary leaders who precipitated that coup and deposed officials of the constitutional government? This is a warped idea of even-handedness, and this is exactly the kind of issue that, that we're talking about. The, the closeness of HRW with the U.S. government creates these completely bizarre forms of even-handedness, which at, you know, first blush may seem speciously independent, but, uh, you know, on, on closer inspection are completely uh, uh, fraudulent. I mean, you know, you can, you can take bits and pieces and, 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 and interpret it the way you want it. Interpret You're, that for me. What, what does that mean? What human, does that signal? Human, human Rights Watch. Why um, didn't it call for the immediate restitution of Aristide government after the coup? That's not what we do. We don't. We don't Why call. Why didn't the, the the atrocities that were we taking did, place? We did in, in Excuse me. Why we didn't, did announce. We we did denounce the atrocities. And since prosecution seems to be your touchstone for things. We've been involved, in, and I've personally been involved, in, in attempts to prosecute a number of former de facto and military Haitian leaders, if that's your only, if that, if that's your touchstone. Well, I find it very curious that Human Rights Watch will appeal to the OAS Democratic Charter in the question of Chavez's uh, uh, court packing in Venezuela, but would not appeal to the OAS Democratic Charter uh, in the case of Aristide's uh, uh, ouster, the, an unconstitutional ouster committed by the U.S. government, putting him on a plane and kidnapping him. In and sending him to Africa. Why didn't it invoke the UA, the UA OAS charter? We're going to break, and then when we come back, uh, we'll talk specifically about Venezuela. We are speaking uh, with Keen Bot, lead organizer of an open letter to Human Rights Watch that criticizes what it calls its revolving door policy. Reed Brody is counsel and spokesperson for Human Rights Watch. This is Democracy Now! We'll be back with them in a minute.